and uh, to be with the body. And I was just thinking, really honestly, what an oasis this body is here, isn't it? I mean, uh, you know, it's out there, a dry and desert land. We come in here, we sing praises to the Lord, we rejoice in the Lord, and it's a tremendous privilege. And uh, just before the testimony, I just want to just say that, you know, the music team, the praise and worship, I mean, just going out before, they're like a banner, aren't they? Yeah. They just really just go up before and give them a hand. They're, awesome. they're really, really awesome. Well, I, I took my first long-distance train ride in India. Loved every bit of it. And, uh, and uh, then we arrived, um, I believe we arrived uh, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday afternoon. And we passed through our pit. Uh, he had everything set up, everything organized. Uh, many, initially, uh, many of his leaders had come, traveled a long distance. Uh, we had afternoon meetings, and uh, Pastor Tool spoke, and uh, we just had a wonderful time. And then afterwards, we had uh, question and answers. And that first night, uh, every part of it was a highlight, but the first night we were invited um, to like a small little community. I call them a community, it was like a street. And uh, there was a gathering was set up, uh, Pastor Commission, many of you know him, and uh, he was leading his song, going out as the banner before the message. Pastor O'Toole gave a wonderful message. Um, you know, people that had never heard the gospel, never heard the gospel, never, maybe never heard much of the name of Jesus, that they were listening and they were sitting, there was probably about 50 people there, 20 from our team, and 30 uh, from the area. And uh, as Pastor uh, Arpit gave the invitation, or Pastor O'Toole did, I don't know which, but uh, we all bowed, and then, uh, and then uh, uh, the invitation was given up in 19 precious hands. Raise your hands for that. It was like... It was like all of heaven opened up. All of heaven looked down. The, we're, they were, heaven's not interested in the Taj Mahal. It's not interested in the big stock exchanges, but it's interested in that very, very simple meeting where 19 individuals received Christ. And then after that, we had uh, wonderful meetings uh, in the morning, then in the afternoon sessions. Um, where we had questions and answers. Um, the concentration of the individuals in uh, Gujarat is phenomenal. And Pastor Arpit is, really has some mighty, mighty men around him. Um, many traveled a long distance. Uh, many in the Bible College are really, really focused young men. And uh, our last day there, uh, we once again had some meetings in the morning and then after that, we traveled to a village. And I would like to preface it, you know, that the things that we see, really honestly, there has been the, the, the hand of God behind the scenes in all of it. And uh, this was not done by any men or uh, planning or anything like that. It was really that God really, really did it. And uh, in Baltimore, there's like a week of prayer going on where they gather two hours in the morning, two in the afternoon, and two, two in the evening. And Pastor Schaller, as a man of prayer, and a man of word, a man of the vision, uh, he just really wanted that designated week of prayer. And uh, India was uh, being prayed for on Thursday, or Asia, and targeting India. And uh, we saw the results in Gujarat. Uh, we went to a village. I had never been to a village in India. I had been to villages in Sri Lanka. But uh, uh, precious people, and we, uh, we were showing the Jesus film, and uh, we got there about six. It started in the evening. Uh, we stayed and fellowshiped in a pastor's home prior to that. And then the people started coming. And uh, uh, just coming, you know, in dribbles and drabbles and, and coming with excitement and bringing their families and sitting on mats. And a total of about 250 to maybe 300 people came to hear, uh, to watch the Jesus film. And uh, uh, after...
Pastor, uh, Pastor Tool gave a great message. Pastor Arpet gave the invitation. And uh, literally about one-third of the crowd raised their hand for salvation. And uh, it, was, it was so, so precious. And uh, afterwards, uh, some came up to us and they were talking and wanted to know more, wanted to learn more. And uh, the highlight of the trip was, if you know the great evangelist, or heard of him, D.L. Moody, in, uh, in uh, Chicago, in America, he always used to speak of, after his campaigns, that he would have like an inquiry room. And uh, we don't use that term now. I think it's very, very good. Um, but it's an uh, inquiry room. It's people, after they would hear the message of salvation, uh, that they would be gathered together in a, in a room, those that were interested, some uh, to be, you know, made knowledgeable of exactly what they did and to, and to establish them in the faith and to give them, you know, scripture references and, and to help them in their spiritual growth. Um, and then the others, okay, to, that maybe are truly not born again, have not received eternal life, but they are desiring to learn more of it, to begin to, uh, to talk with them. And maybe a, a testimonies of really talking with people one-on-one -on -one for like an hour or so, and then they become fully persuaded, and they embrace the truth of eternal life, and they receive Christ as a Savior. Well, that's what we had that night. We had, uh, we had like 12 men. And to me, coming from America, I mean, like, you know, these are like, you know, early disciple-looking type of men. I mean, these are, these are not hard men on their heart, but these, these are hard-working men, okay, that are, you know, the, all different types. And they came after probably working all day, listening, okay, uh, to the Word of God and the movie, and they came to inquire. And you know what they wanted to inquire about? They want to inquire about eternal life. Tell us more about eternal life. We want to fully understand that, and uh, and and we want to embrace that. And uh, they stayed there uh, for about an hour. Pastor Arpit and Pastor O'Toole uh, spoke with them, and uh, it was very very precious. Uh, the focus of these individuals. So your prayers for Gujarat. And uh, um, pray that uh, that that there could be, there's a church established in that area. It's in Tamsa, but also okay that it would really really grow, and that those that receive Christ would be would be drawn in to learn, uh, just like you and I have been drawn in to learn. To learn right? Amen. You love the drink, didn't you? Yes. <laughs> okay, this is the place that we went to the first evening. This is a place about 15 minutes away from where the center is in Anand. And it's a place called Moga. Okay, and it's, I mean, this is the village street actually. We're sitting right in the middle of the street. Just like we own it kind of a thing. <laughs> and that's on the corner is Dayabhai. That's the he used to be the most feared man in the village. Okay, a tough guy, but he's gave his heart to the Lord. This is the second meeting that is happening in the village. The first one is a Bible study in his house, and we went there in the night. Uh, there were some other people also unknown to us, 50 meters away. There was a temple inauguration happening at the same time. And when we reached this, like, oh, this is interesting. This right next to it is a. But we had a great time. These people were like really precious. Uh, many of them person. That's his house. It was just actually this team traveling in the tempo in the nights, and uh, we can just skip that. This is the next day. Uh, many of us have seen the entire building, the Anand Center Training Center, and the builder has who owns the whole place has now given Pastor with the garage is down also, and he said use it as the office because the church is growing. And so, <clears throat> earlier we had the church hall and then the office behind. But the church has gone in Anand itself, where Pastor Arpit is now, is gone to about 80 people. So they had to break the office wall and make it into one hall, right? And that's just grown. 
you know, there is no office, so the builder comes and says, I know you guys, just take both my offices now, use that as your office as bedrooms. So now the whole building is built there. <laughs> That's amazing. So outside we could uh, just put this up and uh, many of the pastors came and uh, this is Pastor Fred, Indian welcome. These are the men in Panch Mahal. Okay? These are uh, seven, eight of them who traveled from far who came that morning and were with us. And uh, These are the pastors of Panch Mahal. We have been to their villages. Next. This is Nanubai. This is where, this, Nanubai's village is where Pastor Mark Knowles went. And uh, they still remember him because of all his illustrations and the way, his boxing illustrations and the way he brought the gospel out. And it's amazing what they remember about his message. It was really precious to be with them. And uh, we had a session we, uh, for we went from like 10 o'clock to 1.30 and then 3 o'clock to 5.30. And uh, this was like in the evening we had a rap session just outside. <clears throat> it's amazing this focus that these uh, people have. They are not only the missionaries but also the church members who are sitting there in the congregation. And, you know, they just keep going on and on and on. And, and there was an older man here. You can't, you can't see him. He's uh, 82 years old. You know, he's doing ministry for 45 years plus. And so that the others would know, he gets up and asks a question. I have a question. So what's your question? There are three questions. Okay, what's the first one? Why did Jesus have to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey? Okay. Why did he have to go on the cross and no other way? And he kept asking these questions for a reason so that other, others would know. And he was smiling from behind and Pastor Bill said, you know, he's asking so that others can understand. And at that age, he was thinking about the new disciples too. Because there were young men sitting there and he, was, he said, they will never ask these questions. And I want you to answer them. And so it's amazing, you know, the passion that these men have, no matter what age they are of. Uh, Pastor Fred then prayed for all the Panch Mahal pastors. You can just keep them in prayer. There are many needs there, but, you know, we just commit those needs to the Lord. And, uh, and then we went for a Gujarati dinner. This was fun too. Okay, and uh, this was a session next day before we went to the village. <coughs> so this is how the team travels, this temple. This temple has gone to every place, 52 villages. <laughs> it's the same driver. Pastor Bill said, this guy has heard the gospel 52 times. <laughs> like, what do you mean? He says, every time we travel, he's the driver. <laughs> he comes, and now he's beginning to help them up with the setup and, you know, giving instructions how to do all that. <laughs> so, anyway, this is the team travels this way. This is how they do. Now, the floodlights, everything is arranged by the team. They carry everything with them, Max. And this is the town, uh, like, you know, they call it the Chow, the main place, where everyone meets if there's anything is happening. And this is, on the left is the building, it's the Gram Panchayat building of that village, okay. About 800 plus people in the whole village. And this is just the beginning of the setup. Next, they put this. This is the crowd that was beginning to gather. And, uh, we took the Jesus film along and <clears throat> the Jesus film is about 45 minutes but I think we got the wrong one. And so <laughs> the movie started with creation and then suddenly Abraham comes on the scene. You wonder like, where is this coming from? And they're shouting, Abraham, Isaac, and I'm like, oh my land. Pastor is saying, why are they taking all these names? These are all Hindus they won't understand anything. They're thinking we're going to preach something else. So I asked him, what next? Then the first miracle that is shown here in this movie is the miraculous catch of fish. And they're all vegetarians. <laughs> and we are sitting behind the movie showing and you're going like, oh. <laughs> then suddenly the movie cut. And then the next miracle is shown, multiplying the bread and the fish. Right? And you're like, oh. You're like wanting to hide, like where do we go? Next shot, crucifixion. We're like, what? Something, I mean, I don't know what we did, but something went wrong there. And in 20 minutes, the whole movie is over. You're like, what do we do? So just go and let's go and preach. So, you know, it was amazing. What, these are times, these are moments where you realize what God can do. <clears throat> these are just moments where you realize you are know, nothing. This is His message. This is His work. He knows exactly how to do it. You just be available. That's all. You don't need to do anything else. And uh, <clears throat> we began to preach. And I got introduced as a Gurukul teacher. I don't know what that means, but... So, we, they take permission from the Sarpanch of the village. 
and then the Sarpanj gives permission to you, you can show the Jesus film. Then we go and show the Jesus film and it's funny because we were told to wear kurtas and all that stuff and the head man came in a suit. <laughs> <laughs> He's in a suit and, and <laughs> okay. So you can see like people all over sitting behind, uh, you can go to the next one. And we just stood and preached the gospel, clear message and uh, this is the salvation club. And you can see everyone right up behind all of people just raising hands. Yeah, that's that's the salvation call, and uh, just amazing. Like this man here is one of the reasons why there is already a missionary in the in the village with very little success. His name is Kalabhai. Kalabhai was uh, you know most famous person in the village because he was an alcoholic, and every day something going on and wrong in the house. He had a son who was mentally challenged, and. Uh, <clears throat> And he, going through a very rough phase in his life, he, his daughter got married and then she was asked by the in-laws to go back. And so it's a, it's a prestige issue, you know, your daughter's come back to the house, your son is mentally ill. Pastor Arpit's dad shared the gospel with him. And the day he accepted the Lord, that very night he stopped drinking. Okay, next week they pray for his son, his son gets cured. Like, just like that. It's normal. And and the following week, the in-laws come and tell the daughter, please come back home. Like one after the other, like that. And now there's a witness in the village. Now, because of him, the Bible study which had two or three people has gone to 35. Amen. Right? And then they went to the Sarpanch and said, we want to show the Jesus. And they said, just show it. Just show it. You know, we can see the life changed. There is something great going on here. We want to be a part of it. And that's what happened in the night. And uh, so these, the other three men are also, two of them are believers, these two are not, and then uh, I think that's, yeah, these were the, later on these men, he brought them, Kalaba brought these men, and Pastor Arpit in his unique style started sharing with them and said, first we will speak, then you speak, I said, yeah. So he finished speaking and he said, now your questions, and after, uh, you know what he said, we don't have any, you've answered everything, we wanted to know about eternal life, we have heard everything. We don't need to hear anything else. And so we got up and we prayed for them. And uh, this is a beautiful time together, right? So I think, yeah, that's, that's all that we have for the picture. So keep the team in prayer. They have uh, many needs. But I think the greatest need that they have is permissions in villages to uh, preach the gospel, go up, show movie shows. And now the time is coming where the, the season begins where they can go to different, different villages. So keep them in prayer. I think they are targeting 15 villages this summer. Where either they will do a satsang or they will show a Jesus movie and then preach. And uh, the whole program lasts for an hour and a half. But the team is very dedicated. Uh, they are thankful for the body here for praying and really being uh, part of the family. And they are excited they will be here in May and then we can fellowship more with them. Wasn't an amazing song? So for a few minutes, uh, before Pastor Shekhar comes up with the message, Romans chapter 10. Verses 10 to 18. And you're familiar with this passage because of verse 17. This faith comes from hearing and hearing the rumors of Christ. So Father, we just want to thank you this morning. Thank you for this. Wonderful time that we put together. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for touching our lives. Thank you, God, for missions. Thank you for touching lives in every area. For all those people, God, in areas we've never heard of who have just believed in you, trusted your name. And following you, preaching, teaching, ministering, changing lives, disciples be raised, Lord, we thank you, we love you, In Jesus' name. Before in the message, I just read an article, and this is about from a missions newsletter, and it says, Every 40 seconds, 
approximately 100 people pass away into eternity. It's amazing, right? 40 seconds. And by the time we finish service, a thousand people would have, more than a thousand people would have gone into eternity somewhere. And they broke it up this way and they said, 32 people know little or do not even care about the name of Christ because they come from traditional backgrounds and are agnostic. Twenty of them are from the Muslim world who know God is the God of judgment but do not believe that Christ is God. Fifteen of them come from a Hindu background who do not have a concept of a personal God but have a hope of promotion in the next life. Five of them come from Buddhist backgrounds who worship millions of small gods and hope that somehow they will help them to evolve to a higher level. Out of the balance, 28, 16 come from Roman Catholic backgrounds who are taught to obey rules and regulations and depend upon sacraments to go to heaven. And from the remaining 12, 7 are actually born again and have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. In that context, uh, when we read Romans chapter 10, of a person who is waiting to hear, and uh, you know, Dr. E. Mayers, a missionary, uh, said, why should a church send out missionaries? He gave four reasons. He says, the first one is because there is a command from above in Mark chapter 16, verse 15, where Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. He said, the second reason why a church should have missions is because there is a cry from beneath in Luke chapter 16, verse 27, where in the story of Abraham and the, and the rich man, he said, send someone to my father's house, send someone to my brother's. The third reason why a church should have a program of missions is because there is a call from outside. In Acts chapter 16, verse 9, the vision of a man crying out in Macedonia, come over, come over and speak to us. And the fourth, he said, is the constraint from within me. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 14, the love of Christ constrains me. And he says, we know of all these three things, but it is the fourth thing that we emphasize of. What's my What's the thing that makes me go and preach? What's the thing that takes me to the mission field? What's the thing? And by the way, when I'm speaking about mission field, I'm not saying that you need to go out and it's, it's good even people go out and plant churches and it's good that has happened. But <clears throat> some are called to be in Jerusalem, in your own city. Some are called to go to Judea and that's nearby. And some are called to go to Samaria and uttermost parts of the world. So when we are talking about missions, it does not mean just going out. It, a big part of it is yes, but a large part also is your home base, where you are. And he says, that's the cry, that the love of Christ constrains me. Like, why do I want to be a part of a movement? Why do I want to share the gospel? Why do I want to care about the loss? And those statistics can overwhelm us and say, wow, I may not be able to do anything, but for one person, it may mean everything. For one soul to be saved, it can be everything. And when we were in Gujarat, we saw that with that man, Galubai, that he has this Nothing basically going on in his life. Nothing going on in his life. And he's known, he has a bad reputation and, and all those things. But one message, one word shared, it changed him. And then life changed. And then people know about Christ. You know what was funny? When we were watching the movie and when the crucifixion scene was going on, this is how people are thinking. And there's a shot where it shows Peter is weeping. And the man sitting next to another one is saying, Oh, the father of this man is weeping. They had no idea. Like that's, they are watching the Jesus film and they are thinking, oh, Peter is this man's father. And they say, oh, the father is feeling so bad for his son. And we thought about it for a little while and I said, that's the concept in their mind. They understand that something wrong has happened here, but they have no idea. And then when you think about it, like, that's the motivation. 
And isn't that Christ's motivation? And then we speak about John chapter 3, 16, which love was the motivation why Christ came on the earth. Love was the motivation that he stepped down from heaven. Love was the motivation because he loved us. Love was the motivation because he wanted us to be with him forever. And it's not only us. It's for him when, when what, what does the verse say in Romans? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. And that includes us. That includes me. And then it also includes the others. And that's why we want to look at people with the eyes of Christ. We want to look at what we do, where we are placed every day with the eyes of Christ. Would Christ let go of an opportunity to reach out, to speak to someone? He would walk 34 miles to reach to a woman in Samaria. Just one. And in Acts 8 we see that many heard, many believed, many going on. And we see those real things happening. They can happen. And where, where, where do we go to share? Where we are? And we can go and share there, right? And <clears throat> while we were teaching the Old Testament prophetics, uh, we talked about the greatest evangelist in the Old Testament was Jonah. Right? He has, he has a one-line message. He has a one-line message and the whole city repents. Right? One-line message. He says the king, the people and even the animals repented. We don't know how the animals repented, right? Like whether they're putting dust on themselves. We have no idea. But there is one, it just says, Jonah preached. It says, 40 days and the kingdom will, and the, the Lord will judge you. And this is the king issued a decree and said, everyone repent. And this is an unwilling man who wants to go. He does not want to go to Nineveh because he knows that if he goes, then God will forgive them. That if he goes and if he preaches and they believe in the Lord, then their sins will be forgiven. And so he says, kill me, but I'm not going there. Throw me into the sea, but I'm not going there. And a change took place in his life, in the, in the belly of the fish. And, uh, and then he's thrown out on the place where he's supposed to be. And then he preaches just one line. And we think about the power of the gospel message. Many times we can go out thinking that we have the right argument, the right words, the right motives. But we don't, let's not forget that there is a God in heaven who is more concerned about the lost soul than we are. Because he sent his son. I may be concerned about the other person, but he is more concerned about the lost soul than I am. And he just waits for me to go. And if I don't go, he'll send someone else. Because his eventuality, he wants none to perish, but everyone to come to the Lord, the knowledge of the living God. 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9. His heartbeat is that none would perish, but all would come to the knowledge of the living Savior. And that's the heart that God has, and that's the heart that God has put in us. <clears throat> and why should we think about, when, and I'm not saying that we don't, but during this trip, uh, God just ministered and spoke so clearly in many areas. And looking at lives of young men and women who were sitting right across us, it was humbling that you could speak to them things and they would hear so attentively. But the passion that they had for lost souls was amazing. And that they would go out hours before, session after session after session, attending it, not thinking about anything, but we need to reach out. We need to reach out. And they're just servant hearts, you know. So, very quickly, just three, three points. What does God look at in missions? First, He looks at the feet. In Isaiah 52 verse, in the, in the chapter of Isaiah 52, which says, how beautiful are the feet, right? And uh, we think um, it's the last thing that we think about when we are getting ready, right? Our feet. We are worried about our face, our hands, our hair, right? How do we are looking? But what, what do we do? We cover our feet, put on shoes and try to make them nice. But God is saying, how beautiful are the feet? Because in Isaiah 52, coming back from the exile, uh, they needed to hear that news, that God is there and He's bringing them back. It, is, it was at the right time, it was in the right place. And uh, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 15, Paul speaks about it. Feet that are ready for the pre pre preaching of the gospel. Feet that are ready. And we want to think about that, like, there is this uh, Pastor Apith was sitting in a meeting 14-15 years ago 
with two and a half thousand people and Pastor Khan was preaching and the translator was preaching everything wrong. And Pastor Suha sitting there is egging on Pastor and saying, Pastor, he's not saying what you're saying. And in that meeting sitting right there was Pastor Arpit and another man called Ramesh. And they got it and said, this is what we want. This is the message that we need, other people need to hear. And as young men, they came to a Bible school. And as young men, they learned and they went out. And when you go to Gujarat or any other mission field, places that we are, you will see the same love. You will see the same affection. You will see the same passion for souls. And what are they concerned about? Yes, theology. Yes, all those things. Yes, it's not. It's, don't think that Bible college is not necessary. Or, you know, I just need to do. No, it's not. And when Paul talks about in Romans chapter 10, he talks about those things. That how will they go unless they are sent? And unless they don't go, then who will, how will they preach? If they don't preach, then how will people hear? And it all in a way begins in the reverse, that we first come into the body of Christ and then we are encouraged and built up. And then we have developed this passion and we are thinking about souls all the time. I, <clears throat> very early in the church, uh, whenever I would travel with Pastor, he was always looking to speak to someone else. And I was in a rickshaw trying to gather his attention so that I can get something from him. But he's more, at, he would talk to me, but then he would talk to this unsaved person first and he would say, let's share first and then we can chat. And for a minute I was thinking, but I, you know, we can do this anytime. But for that moment, that time, it was important for that person to share. And when we think about feet, when we think about the carrying of the gospel message, we are grateful. And, you know, I just want to encourage you, pray for our missionaries who are on the fields. Uh, they go through situations, they go through circumstances. Uh, we, don't, we, don't, we are not ignorant to those things. But uh, <coughs> just pray for them. They live amazingly by faith and love and encouragement. And uh, there are many situations that come up, but, uh, you know, they are just joyful like Lord. Pastor, we are just going to the next village. Pastor, we are just finding the new place. Pastor, we are doing this. Pastor, we are doing that. And it's a joy because <coughs> that's the gospel message. We need those feet to carry the right, the news, right? Because what? Every 40 seconds, 100 people will go away. Every 40 seconds, 100 people will go away. And uh, we have been placed here with a plan. We have been placed here with a purpose. We have been placed with a calling. And uh, no, many trips coming up. Just want to get your heart on fire for the Lord. Just take one trip. Just go on a mission trip. Just go preach. Just go share in a place that you've never been. Just go out by faith. You know, not saying that you're not doing it here, but just go out and get a real feel of how it is. And you'll be grateful and you'll, you'll come back charged. You want to know, share more about mission. Second thing that God looks at, Right, is the hands. Yesterday, when we were coming back by train, uh, Pastor Fred just put his hand out to one of the guys sitting next to us and said, Hey, I'm Fred. And then they had a conversation and he left him with a track and a clear gospel message. And this man's phone started ringing and I said, There we go. Right at the time when the crucial part is coming, the phone rings. And I said, I hope he does not pick up the call. So Lord, just hope he does not. He took the phone, he put it on the side and he kept it upside down and said, keep speaking, keep speaking. What did it take? Just one hand out. Just one hand out. Hi, I'm Fred. And that was it. And we think about that's what we are doing when we are soul winning, right? We're just giving out, hey, this is God's love. Hey, this is God's love, right? This is God's love. Even if you don't see anything, just give it out, it's good. But the third thing is you need to open your mouth sometimes. And what did Jesus say, right? When the, when the hour has come, when the need is there, you open your mouth and I'll put my words in. I'll put my words in. And then leave it to me. The work of convert, the converting the soul, changing the soul, uh, belongs to the Holy Spirit, not mine. And it was very evident because everything could go wrong in the movie, everything could happen, everything could, what should not have happened, what should have not been said was going on. But when the gospel was preached, it just covered everything. There was no one moved. And after that, we just went on our knees, we just gathered back in a room and we said, thank you Lord, only you could do this. 
only you could do this. Human eyes cannot see, we cannot understand, but what only God can do the things. And we just, if we have those, if our feet, if our heart, if our hands, if our mouth are ready and available to the Lord, then God does only what He can do. And God changes lives, you know. And <clears throat> keeping our heart on fire, and I just want to close. Uh, just this few moments, just, just, just think about what we can do to keep our hearts on fire. Gather all the more. Fellowship all the more. Be in the Bible all the more. Uh, you know, walk by faith all the more. Be a part of soul winning every week, if not every day. All the more, wherever you are. Uh, take mission trips, go. Be with, be with the missionaries, encourage them, and get encouraged yourself. You know, when you, <coughs> if you want to try this at home, if you're making tea, and the water is boiling, you just take a little lid of cold water and just put it in. Instantly the boiling stops and it goes and then you need to boil it again. And there are many distractions that can keep that, that take that heart, make our boiling heart cold like that. Many things in the world today, many distractions can make us go like the fire go like that in our lives. But keep it on fire. Don't allow those things to come. Time is short. And we have many things in a way. Why is this praise march is done? Because every 40 seconds, 100 people will go. Why is, why is soul winning everywhere? Why are mission trips being taken? Why is these things happening? Because every 40 seconds, 100 people will go somewhere into eternity. And we do not know. We do not know, but someday, somewhere, Someone will accept the Lord. And then it begins again. Some, somewhere, Kalu Bhai will accept the Lord and God will change his life. And then there will be two people going to 35 and then the village hears. And then they come to the city and then they'll get trained and they'll go somewhere else. And it goes on. And it goes on. How beautiful are the feet of those who carry the good news of the gospel. Amen.